Hello, I'm Tracy Kuchker. I'm director curator at Salmon Arm Art Gallery. And during May and June, during the global pandemic, we are featuring or we are re-featuring uh, our very keen interest in songbirds in the shoe swap and bringing back some experts and some wonderful artwork that was created during the flight exhibition in April and May of 2019. And one of the people who were at the bird conversations, leading a conversation about habitat, was our guest today, Richard Mann. Hi, Dick. Hi, how are you doing, Tracy? I'm doing great, actually. It's a beautiful day out there and a really great day to learn about birds. Yes, it is. Yeah, any day is a great day to learn about birds. Yeah. You know what's really funny is we planned this theme. And then uh, this morning, I read in the Globe and Mail this great big center page article about how during this pandemic, it's the thing to do to learn about birds. Oh, that's great. Yeah, we can just look out the window and learn more about the little creatures that are flitting in. It's the middle of the spring migration, so it's perfect timing. Yes, it is, yeah. Yeah. There's lots of resources. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So one of the things that you talked about during bird conversations was habitat and how to make your yard more... Um, pleasing and friendly and welcoming to birds and healthy of course for birds mm -hmm. um, but maybe before you talk about that you can tell us how it is you became interested in birds well i i grew up on a farm in southeastern saskatchewan and a lot of people think of the prairies as being this desolate flat land and and not a whole lot of life around but it's amazing what's out there but i i believe that the main reason I got interested in birds was um, a role model that I had when I was a kid and growing up and and even as a young adult he was still he was still alive and that was my uh, great uncle my grandfather's one brother um, he was kind of quirky in some ways and he he stood out from the rest of the family in some respects um, but he he was an active trapper um, he was a naturalist um, and he he shared a lot of, of his knowledge with me. And I think that was, that was the first sort of um, uh, interest that, that, or that's what generated my interest, I think, over, over, uh, over time and got me going onto it. Um, also, just being on a farm and seeing what was around in springtime and, you know, and, and we had a, a cow pasture nearby and and there were birds that traveled through there and we had a little slew right next to the house and you know there was there was um, I, I remember um, a yellow-headed blackbird showing up one year what the heck are these things you know just total out, out of the ordinary from the red winged blackbirds and, and the brewers blackbirds that had been around so um, just a matter of being out there and, and with his encouragement I guess and an example that he gave me um, nice. that, that got me started Fantastic. And then, of course, you spent 30 some years as a fish and wildlife officer in Alberta. So you must have come across a great many species while you were doing that. Yes. Um, you know, working in a number of locations, both in southern, northern and central Alberta. Um, then also when we moved to BC, I worked off and on with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans here. And even though the focus was fish, um, fish habitat and bird habitat and insect habitat are all uh, blended together. There's no way you can distinguish one from the other really. Um, it's all part of a web that we're a piece of the same puzzle. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Okay, so getting now to our very tiny little worlds that we've been reduced to during the pandemic, <laughs> our mm -hmm. yards, and of course in the shoe swap we're mostly very fortunate to have yards. A lot of people in bigger centers don't. They're just, all they've got is their balconies and the hope of capturing sight of a uh, uh, raptor in the sky or something. But uh, for those of us do, that do have yards, let's talk about what we can do in our yards that will make it more welcoming and more friendly to birds. So okay. What's your advice? Um, yes, and, and I've taken the opportunity, both my wife Mickey and I have had the opportunity, even though I'm fortunate to get outside and walk my dog twice a day, early morning and later on in the evening, but um, just watching the bird activity in our yard uh, that's that's come through and some of it is is if you want to call it local other is migratory bird species they're coming through now um, basically birds have the same needs that we do 
basically food, shelter, and water. And so if you can provide some mix of that, you are going to be attracting birds or um, making it bird friendly. And uh, they, will, they will come eventually. It may take, in some cases, even years before they finally, you become on their radar screen that you are available. And so it's not a matter of, of them instantly showing up, but you know you have to be patient in some cases. So bird water, or sorry, food, water, and, and shelter of one form or another definitely helps. Okay, so what kind of shelter are you talking when you say shelter? Well, in terms of nesting habitat, for example, mm -hmm. and we have a number of cavity nesting birds that, that um, are local, if you want to call them. Um, chickadees, for example, nut hatches, our cavity nesters, uh, bluebirds, which are migratory birds, and also swallow species. So tree swallows, cliff swallows, bank swallows are all cavity nesters. And so if we can provide some form of habitat for them in terms of nesting habitat, um, they, will, they will come. Uh, for example, we've had a nest box on our fence for five years. Finally, this year is the first year that the black cap chickadees have utilized it. And so it's very gratifying to see them checking it out first of all, the birds in and out of the nest box and, you know, kind of chirping and, and calling to each other. They're checking it out. And then eventually they started carrying material into the nest. And so that's very gratifying to see that activity. Right. Um, other and shelter, for example, pardon me? Well, how many, like if you're trying to attract many birds to your yard, how many bird houses can you feasibly have in your yard that would not in like make it too dense a population well you know you can put lots of houses up but they will decide amongst themselves how comfortable they are with each other oh. um species like uh, cliff or bank swallows are very gregarious so um their tolerance of nesting in proximity of each other is is more is a higher tolerance level so they will they will nest closer to each other whereas um Tree swallows, you're probably looking at a couple of hundred feet at least. So most backyards are not going to be um, capable of hosting more than one pair. Wow. But if you, if you put two or three nests up, they will select the one that is most suitable for them. Um, the other thing you can do is also, if you've got a wood fence, you can also put them on, say, on the inside and the outside of the fence um, on different posts, for example, so that... Um, they will find which one is more attractive to them. Also, um, chickadee species and swallow species can will nest in closer proximity of each other because they're not necessarily competing for the same food sources. Whereas species like chickadees and nuthatches uh, may become a, an issue, you know, because they they are feeding mainly on the same source of, of uh, food because they are, they are gleaning insects mostly off the trees. They're feeding on seeds where swallows are flying and catching their prey in the air. So they're not directly competing with each other for food resources. Mm. So, but, you know, if you, if you have a yard, um, you can try placement. Um, you know, for example, our neighbor has a nest box on the side of its house, of their house, and the tree swallows use it year after year after year. And, and they're walking within three to four feet of this nest box in and out of their house. And they're very tolerant of people. Wow. So uh, in the right circumstances, you know, yeah. if, if you, you encroach on a nest in the wild, for example, they're going to be less tolerant. But if they come to you, to your habitat, if you want to call it that, in your yard, they are going to be more tolerant of, of being close to people. So... Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's up to the birds to decide how many will comfortably nest in a yard. Okay. So, so there's nest boxes that are one aspect of it. For other bird species that build their nests in trees, more often than not, you're not going to find the nest until late fall and winter once the leaves are gone. So, um, you know, providing larger mature trees for nest cover in some cases works. There's other bird species like, uh, uh, juncos, dark-eyed juncos, which are ground nesters. Um, there's other species such as um, uh, pine siskins and some of the um, of the uh, warbler family members that will nest in shrubs as well. So having plantings of different heights definitely helps attract birds as well. Um, Is there something we can do about 
protecting the ground nesters. Like I know in my neighborhood, we have a few people in the neighborhood who let their cats out. And I know that cats have come into my yard and feasted on babies that have lived here, like quail babies and yes. um, who knows what else, right? Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there was something we can do to create ground cover or, uh, you know, sort of tangled brushes or something that would make it a little bit more protective for the birds that nest on the ground or near the ground. Yeah, there's, that becomes a big issue and, and there's a lot of bird mortality caused by cats. Um, people tend to think that cats are fine outside, that that's part of, of what they are. Um, we have two house cats and the only time that they are outside is when I am with them under supervision. So, and, and they're happy with that. Um, they are definitely interested in birds and we've been fortunate that they have not actually caught a bird. And the odd time they try stalking one, but the birds are long gone before they get anywhere as near. But yeah, there's, you can, shrubby plants like roses, for example, more so wild roses that are kind of brambly, for example, uh, blackberry bushes, and sometimes, you know, there are wild blackberries here and there that, that, uh, that do grow. Those type of sort of brambly type plants are the ones that will provide more cover for ground nesters. Um, taller grass, if, and people feel that that's unkempt, and that's not the way that what what not what they envision in yards is to have longer grasses, but those will help as well. Um, so th that's one way of trying to encourage ground nesters. Um, also, even in an area that has some a bit of cover, just putting up some uh, fencing, for example, like um, uh, stucco wire or even chicken wire, because a lot of those smaller birds that are ground nesters will move in and out through the wire but it is preventing predators from getting through, predators like cats. Right. So it provides them some cover, but you also have to remember some of those ground nesters, once their young start to roam with them, um, especially quail babies, once they're hatched, they're on the move. Yeah. So that become, can become an issue with them, and they aren't gonna be able to get through um, wires like stucco wire and, and, uh, and chicken wire, but you know, smaller songbirds can't. Yeah. But once their young ones um, are are fledging, they will they will be susceptible somewhat. So you know that's always an issue as well. Okay, so just being able to allow some brambly bushes and shrubberies to grow in your yard and not have to keep everything super tidy and neat is a good. Yes, yes, yeah. that's a, that's that's a very good habitat strategy to provide yeah. for those type of birds. Okay, and so now let's talk about water source. So what does a water source, a good, clean, you know, practical water source look like for birds? There's lots of options. You know, whatever, whatever you can think of probably will work as long as you don't have a lot of depth. Um, you have to remember these are birds with short legs. They're not waterfowl. They're not shorebirds. So, um, you know, you need something that, that has some water depth to it, but not a lot of water. So even if you have a bit of depth to it, you can put rocks in place. Um, which provides some more shallow areas for them to get on and drink or to even bathe, for example. Uh, running water is great if you can, if you can um, set something up so you have a small little stream or even a fountain. Uh, the sound of the water will attract birds as well. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of options available. Um, when we lived in southern Alberta, in Canmore actually, in the foothills and, and mountains, our biggest source of water that we provided for birds was a galvanized pail. I dug a hole, put it in the ground, filled it with rocks, and then we filled it with water. And it was a bird magnet. We had all kinds of birds of different species that came in. And it, it was relatively easy to care for. You have to make sure, especially in summertime, that you have to empty it from time to time, clean the rocks because they are going to form algae on them so that you continue to have a clean source of water. Um, if you have a backyard pond, um, there again, if you can provide some shallow areas, tree cover or shrub cover nearby will also attract the birds as well to the water sources because a lot of times after they're done bathing, they want to go somewhere and preen themselves, and clean themselves up. So having those perching areas where, that have some cover as well will provide them with safety as well as the water source. Right. Nice. Okay, now let's talk about the food. So okay. What's the practical foods, food choice for birds in this area? 
The ones that work the best, uh, there's a couple. One are black oil sunflower seeds, also Niger seed, which is um, a, it's an exotic thistle, but it does not sprout at all. So you're not going to get a lot of growth of the thistle during the summertime. But it, that seed, excel, the Niger seed, will provide an excellent food source for birds like pine siskins, goldfinches, um, a lot of those smaller birds as well, juncos as well. Um, they will also feed on black oil sunflower seeds, but um, if they do, if they are presented with niger seed, they will definitely feed on that as well. And it, it will not attract squirrels uh, with niger seed. Black oil sunflower seed um, will attract squirrels as well as the birds. It will also attract rats because we do have an influx of rats in the area. And so you want to try and prevent providing food sources for rats especially. Squirrels are okay, but they can also get aggressive and they can also um, take over a feeder and they will try to kill birds to protect their territory then. Okay. Um, so those are the two main food sources that work well. So you want a, a food source that is high in protein, also high in energy in the winter time for them to help keep them going um, you know, during the toughest part of the year. So those are the preferred species. You will see a lot of times wild bird mixes in, uh, available in stores. And that is a lot of grains and millet and sorghum as well with cracked corn. Uh, and cracked corn especially has its place uh, for ground feeders like um, pheasants and quail. They prefer that as well, um, as well as the black oil sunflower seeds. But if you're targeting the bird feeder type birds that come in on a hanging feeder or a post feeder, um, stay away from the wild bird mix because it's a lot of seed that just ends up on the ground and, and is of no value that just wasting your money on. Right. Yeah, that's something else is we want to attract um, birds that otherwise would be um, like maybe struggling, right? Like maybe struggling yeah. to find like insectivores or omnivores, I suppose, that we're in areas where we have reduced insect populations just because of agriculture practices. We want to make sure that we're helping those birds specifically. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, the other thing as well, there are plantings that you can make of, of, of native species that will provide wintertime food as well. Uh, the main one I'm thinking of is, is mountain ash that, pr that produce red berries. Um, and those are, are very in demand for bird species like robins because we do have robins that overwinter. Uh, we get wax wings that come through in the winter time. And so they feed on those berries a lot as well. And so they are more insectivorous birds, but they, so they ne won't necessarily feed on um, on seed at all, but that way we can provide them food as well. Right. And so, um, so, so if you have a big mountain ash tree in your neighborhood, don't cut it down. Don't cut it down. No, definitely not. Um, the winter before last, the winter of 2018, 19, there was mountain ash berries on every tree in Salmon Arm, I think. Mm -hmm. And, um, there again, we have mountain ash tree and that was the only year that we've had robins and cedar waxwings come into our tree during the winter time. The other years they just didn't show up for whatever reason. So our tree got cleaned off in three or four days. Um, last year there was very little bloom on any mountain ash and so the birds suffered from that. Mm -hmm. But I see this year there are a lot more blossoms that will be blooming again so there should be hopefully a good crop of berries for them again as well. Yeah, I noticed that too. Why Why did we have that um, weird mountain ash berry dearth? Like it seemed like it just didn't, it, we didn't have a bloom. Maybe the trees uh, had too late of a frost or something. Um, it's, hard, it's hard to say. There's, there could be a number of factors. One may have been the cold part of the winter that we had the year before or the year ago in winter that ended up killing blossoms. It could be because they produced so many berries the year before that uh, they may need a resting period. Hmm. Um, so it, it, I really don't know. You'd have yeah. to talk to a botanist about that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But it's just kind of good to notice. Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, to notice the things in our environment that might affect the birds and their feeding sources. So, um, yeah, I just feel like noticing that and recognizing that there's no mountain ash berries in Salmon Arm meant that we made sure our feeder was full all winter long. Yes, yeah, because they need those alternate food sources. Yeah. So it's not that you're making birds 
dependent on human contact to survive and supplementing what's out there for them. Because by and large, they will forage and find a good amount of their food, but uh, especially in a tough winter, that extra food that we can provide them uh, provides them the insurance that they are going, going to survive and continue to thrive in our area. Yeah. So it's the, just options that are available. Is there any other flowers or shrubs or berries that would make sense to have in our yard that would feed the birds in the winter time? In the winter time? Like elderberries? Or yeah, elderberries are another, any of them, especially native species. Those are the ones that the birds have evolved with. So, uh, you know, and, and it's not that our birds by and large that are here in the winter time are, mi are migrants from elsewhere. Um, because the birds that migrate further south are used to winter vegetation in the areas they're going to, which they, they evolve naturally with. So we, we need the care for the birds that are bait. A lot, most of them are year round residents to our area. So yeah, things like elderberry, uh, even snowberry, they will feed on those. Yeah. Um, native hawthorn, any native berry species around the area, Saskatoons, because there are dried Saskatoons left, they will feed on those as well. So anything that's native um, will work very well as a food source for them. Um, and then what about in the spring, like as birds are migratory, migrating through our area, mm -hmm. is there anything, like I noticed that um, when we have seen uh, white, white, what is it, white crown sparrows? White crown sparrows, yes. They feed on dandelion seeds, right? Yes, and this year especially, I noticed that um, the white crown sparrows, have actually most of them have left now. Um, the day before yesterday, there were flocks of them coming through our yard yet. Yesterday we had three or four and there's not a bird, not a song sparrow or a white crown sparrow around today at all. Hmm. And the dandelions are just blooming. So for some reason this year, they are not coordinated with, with, the, uh, with the production of seeds by dandelions. But that is a major food source for them as they migrate further north and to higher elevations. We're just a short time stopping point for them to fuel up and continue their journey to their nesting areas. So it's, yeah, they do depend on a lot of those native, well, I guess dandelions aren't really native, but they're, they're part of our culture. <laughs> They've made themselves very welcome here. <laughs> okay, for sure. well, or unwelcome in some cases. But anyways, yes, the, that food source hasn't been available to them. So um, we had lots of them in our yard feeding on sunflower seeds again. Um, and it's interesting watching them because they're they're gleaning through the grass, they're scratching around like little chickens and they're looking for whatever food they can find. And suddenly one of them would hop or run onto the concrete or our patio with a sunflower seed and they would keep working on it until they got it broken open and, and got the seed out of it and then go back on and con continue foraging. So um, those food sources are still important to, to the migratory birds to some extent and helps them carry on. Um, another bird species that uh, that's migrates through and also becomes resident through the summer are hummingbirds, which, you know, people are very endeared to hummingbirds, or hummingbirds are very endeared to people, whichever way you, you're supposed to say it. Anyways, um, so providing hummingbird feeders is, is a, a very good strategy there again. Um, and there again, it took us a number of years before hummers came to our yard, but mm -hmm. now they are coming and seem to be somewhat resident. We haven't noticed any sign of nesting of them, um, but a lot of times you won't find the nest either. Right, because the nest is like this big. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yes. And then usually in heavy, heavy coniferous cover. So there again, if you have fir trees or spruce trees in your yard, it does provide a habitat for birds. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about hummingbird feeders for a second? Because I, I haven't, fortunately, I haven't seen those awful packages of red colored sugar. Yeah, <laughs> Kool-Aid for birds. Yeah, but they don't, <laughs> it's just really important to, know, to note that they don't need the red food coloring in the feed itself. They just need a bright colored feeder that will attract them. It makes it look like a flower, right? They will learn to come to pretty well anything. That, yeah. that continues the that contains the uh, the food source, but yes, basically plain water and sugar, and we use a ratio of one cup of each, one cup of, of boiled water, one cup of sugar. Uh, we mix them when when the water is boiled, and then let it cool before we put it in the feeder. But you also have need to change it on a regular basis. 
because it begins to ferment, it gets moldy inside, and you could end up causing sickness in the birds or, or even death um, if they end up with, with bird food or nectar that's been out there for months and months in the hot sun every day. <laughs> yeah. So you do need to change it. But yeah, it's uh, there was a young girl many years ago who did a study on what attracted hummingbirds. And she tried um, all kinds of different feeders. And she found that once they learned that the food was in a, available in any kind of feeder, they would come to it. Hmm. So it doesn't have, even have to be a red feeder. Um, as long as it has sort of the, it's more, I guess, the shape of the, the feeding orifice, if you want to call it that. It kind of looks like a flower or, or a port, I guess, that, that they would uh, will come to. Providing a perch below that, that feeding port also helps as well because it allows them then the perch once they become comfortable with that and yeah. will actually sit at the feeder and, and, uh, and feed rather than just hovering there. Right. Yeah. And it's kind of important to keep hummingbirds um, fed in this weather because not everything is blooming yet, right? That's right, yes. Um, they will try dandelions from time to time. I've seen them actually in dandelion flowers, but columbines, um, any tubular type flowers. Yeah, the bee balm and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, bee balm, they really love that. Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a number of native plants there again, as well as, as, uh, even ornamentals, but I'd like to stress that we should try and plant as much native as we can. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you should rip out any plantings that you have, but if you're considering adding plantings or changing what you've got in your yard, definitely consider going to native species because that's what our, um, birds and insects have evolved with. And so, um, so that's very much of a benefit. Yeah. Also, hummingbirds do need about 15 to 20 percent of their diet to be protein, which people don't think of that. So um, things like small insects and, and small spiders are a major food source for them. So um, they will hunt um, in amongst other plants looking for that protein source. So it's not just the liquid sugar that they require. There's, there's also the need for protein, especially once they are feeding fledge or nestlings as well. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. So they're eating all those little spiders that are uh, living off of the corners of our eaves trough and stuff, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you find a little little spider nest that looks like a little cotton ball, just leave that because the hummingbirds will eventually find it. Ah, nice. Okay, good to know. Spiders are our friends. <laughs> yes, spiders are our friends. <laughs> Well, this has been really great, very informative, and I really appreciate you giving us this time. I think that's a very, you know, very shoe swap kind of perspective that you've given us on how to make sure that we have a healthy yard and that we're always going to be welcoming to birds. So thank you so much for this. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Oh, good. Any yeah. final words of advice for, for bird anythings? For bird anything? Oh yes, one thing we didn't talk about is trying to prevent bird crashes into your windows. Oh my gosh, yes, that's true. Yes, yes. Um, there's a number of options for that because um, we tend to want to have feeders near our house so we can observe what's going on um, and, and try and identify bird species that we are getting to them, but um, that can cause bird crashes. Just also birds moving around, especially if you've got um, species like robins, for example, who are very territorial and they'll start chasing away another male, for example, a lot of times they'll come crashing into a window. So there are a number of methods of preventing that. Um, typically, you can, you know, people have hung little uh, silhouettes of birds of prey uh, in front of their window. They've used um, ribbon, uh, reflective ribbon tape that, that um, will hopefully break up that image or give, give the birds a warning that that they um, uh, that there was something of danger there. But you told me about an interesting thing that you've read about. Yeah, well, you can apparently uh, measure out on your the biggest windows that cause the most problems, of course, because it looks like you know a clear tunnel to the next world. Um, to create a pattern with um, a, a string going across your window every six inches, you make a little dot with a black Sharpie. So six inches across and then drop the string, six inches across, six inches, six inches. And what you're doing is creating a pattern on your window. And when birds see pattern as barriers, 
So you would definitely find that they would be like, oh, whatever that is, I, it's like a fence or a net or something. They would see it as something they can't fly through. And a lot of people think that that would be really distracting for them, but a lot of um, sky rises and you know, businesses have done it. And people find that they just don't see it after a while. Like mm -hmm. looking out your window, you just don't see this, these little dots anymore. And if you want to remove them, if it really bothers you in the fall and you, and you want the, your view back, you can just wash it off. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an easy and really, really effective way of preventing bird window crashes. Yeah, so I learned something when you told me about that. I hadn't heard of that at all. So. Yeah, well, and it's just the way birds see. I learned about that during the flight exhibition because of one of the artists, Jane Byrne, who talked about how birds see. And it was just fascinating. And, and they, they do, they see pattern as, um, like they're just different. The way they view things is very different. So doing a little research on that made it like, wow, I totally get why this happens and why they fly into windows. And um, yeah, so yeah. like there are a lot of resources out there, like you said, so. Oh yes, yeah. And, and back in the old days, this is all we had were books. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now there's so much more information available um, on the internet. Yes. Yeah. Same one. Yes. Um, this, like this is right by our window all the time. This yeah. and, and these like yes. this, this is all you need, man. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. But also if you're interested in, in, or people are interested in making nest boxes, there are resources on the internet, but there again, this is what I started with back in the eighties, mid eighties. Wow. And I still have a copy of it. It has all the dimensions for the birds, the, uh, the nest boxes that are required. Also the diameter of the holes because different bird species right. require different holes sizes because of body size. And it also, if you have a hole that's too large, you could end up with, with predatory birds trying to get into the nest boxes or squirrels getting into the nest boxes, right. kill the fledglings. So it's, um, uh, it's very, it's the, the proper size of the holes and the dimensions of the nest box are very important. Yeah. A lot of those resources are in paper uh, form, but also they are available on the internet. Right. All right. Well, that was okay. awesome. Thank you so very much and happy birding. Yes. Thank you. You too. I'm even when I'm walking my dog at four 30 in the morning on work mornings, I'm hearing birds this time of year. Yeah. You know, so it's very amazing that, you know, that it's still pitch black out there. And bird species like, like song sparrows or robins are singing at that time of the day already when most humans are still asleep. Yeah. So it's, it's a pretty neat experience being out on a clear morning and hearing the birds singing and being able to see Saturn and Mars in the sky yet. So just the combination of everything just sets my day. Oh, that sounds wonderful, but I'm so not getting up at 4.30. <laughs> I'll wait until 8.30 to hear the birds out there. <laughs> good. Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks again. Have a wonderful spring. Thank you. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.